Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar hosted by Creative Bell Labs. We are a CRO that offers one-stop and comprehensive bi-specific antibody development services using our unique bi-specific antibody generation platforms. We have designed and produced different formats of bi- and tri-specific molecules for our clients, such as IgG-like, appended IgGs, and bi-specific fragments. And the theme of our web webinar today is one of our favorites, bi-specific bi antibodies. We have invited two brilliant scientists here to tell us how our teams harness the power of bi-specific antibodies. So before we get started introducing our first speaker for today's webinar, I want to quickly let our audience know that please feel free to type your questions in the QA panel during the presentations. And our speakers will get to the questions during the QA session at the end of the today's webinar. So we have two speakers today so when typing your questions, please add to whom your questions should be addressed. All right. Our first speaker is Dr. Archana Taku. She is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Virginia School of Medicine and a director of a human cellular therapeutics CGMP core at the University of Virginia. Dr. Takur facilitates the scientific, strategic, and operational directions for the clinical immunotherapy product development and oversees the manufacturing of bispecific antibodies and bispecific antibody armed activated T cells in the CGMP facility, as well as the immune monitoring studies on the proctor group driven clinical trials. Dr. Taku's research interests include novel and innovative therapeutic strategies for both blood and solid tumors. Her research activities are focused on developing new and innovative approaches to enhancing anti-tumor cellular and humoral immune responses by attenuating the immune surprising cellular and humoral factors within the tumor microenvironment and identifying immune biomarkers to develop immune signatures for therapeutic responses. And her talk today is about bispecific antibody armed metabolically enhanced headless CAR T cells. And our second topic today will be presented by Dr. Luca Varani. He leads the structural biology group in the IRB to characterize interactions between pathogens and antibodies, as well as molecules of the immune system using a highly multidisciplinary approach spanning from computational biology, structural determination, cellular experiments, and to antibody production and engineering. Dr. Warani's group tries to understand molecular properties that allow a given antibody to eliminate a pathogen involving rare and neglected diseases such as dengue or Zika virus, prion diseases, and a rare form of leukemia. Today, these topics is bi-specific antibody protects from SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern and prevents viral escape in mice. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Takura and Dr. Varani. Okay, so let's start our first session. Hi, Dr. Um, Takur, you can begin when uh, you are ready. Okay. Yes. You can see now? Okay. Yes. All right. Good morning, everybody. And I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar and the Creative BioLabs for the invitation to present my work. And with that, since my presentation is on the bi-specific antibody armed headless CAR T cells, which are the combination of bispecific antibodies and CAR T cells, I'll start with a very brief overview of the bispecific antibodies and CAR T cells, discussing their formats and clinical data, then moving on to the bispecific antibody on T cells and uh, bispecific antibody on headless CAR T cells. Main focus would be on the solid tumors. So bispecific antibodies have a long history in making. The earliest bispecific antibodies were produced either by the quadroma technology or, uh, or the chemical hydroconjugation of two monoclonal antibodies. But the real revolution came after the development of the recombinant technology 
and we now have the uh, large number of uh, technology platform providing diverse array of uh, biospecific antibody formats. Uh, broadly, uh, these all all kinds of uh, formats can be uh, classified into two uh, major classes: those bearing the um, FC um, FC region and those lacking the FC region. And here are the three different uh, categories of uh, biospecific antibodies based on their molecular weights. Uh, they fall into the small, medium, or large sizes. Both bite and uh, darts are the small molecule, uh, small construct, monovalent small construct, and uh, the and they, they are really arranged heavy heavy chain and light chains are arranged in the same orientation in the bite as shown here. Uh, and the linkers here are really important that provide the stability, um, correct folding, and the binding uh, uh, and the binding affinity for uh, these antibodies. The dark, the uh, light and heavy uh, cognate light and heavy chains are on two different polypeptides, which are stabilized by disulfide bridge here. Um, so these are the they, they fall into the smaller size they range the. Uh, the size range from 55 to 58 kilodaltons. Then comes the medium size, which is the tandem uh, biospecific and uh, tandem antibody, which is a bivalent biospecific antibody. So they have two SCFV for each antigen, um, and uh, they 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 have a greater avidity for the antigen binding and also greater uh, stability, uh, serum stability. The cross uh, biospecific antibody has the FC domain, which provides the scaffold for two um, antigen binding domains here. And they have, uh, this is a large full size uh, IgG kind of a molecule and has a greater uh, serum stability. And here are some of the um, examples, different biospecific antibody formats. They vary in the size, valency, half-life, biodistribution. Larger size have more serum stability, and uh, smaller size have a superior tumor penetration. So basically, they all vary in this reason a lot. Here are some of the uh, early uh, phase trials in solid tumor with various formats of biospecific antibodies. Most of the biospecific antibodies are T cell recruiting uh, antibodies, which has uh, one of the partner is anti CD3. Um, there are uh, others are uh, either they are directed either to inhibit the tumor growth or to inhibit the factors that promote the tumor growth such as uh, VEGF and DLL4 to inhibit the uh, notch signaling and VEGF signaling. So, uh, and I mean, we can see here the TOX profile uh, across the board is pretty much uh, similar. And we do see some of the, um, you know, objective responses, some CRs and PRs, but most of these have shown just disease stabilization. And every year, like 19, in 2022, um, in 2020, we added almost a um, little more than 100 uh, new clinical trials uh, using the biospecific antibodies. But I mean, so far, we have not uh, gotten any success, um, especially in the solid tumor. I mean, we do have one approved biospecific antibody, the uh, bilitinumab uh, for ALL. But others are in the clinical. There are some promising results in the uh, in, in the hematological malignancies, but in solid tumor arena, I think we are still facing some some of the challenges. Now moving on to the um, chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells, um, I'll just discuss quickly discuss the multiple formats and clinical data. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure the audience of uh, this webinar is very familiar with the structure of the CAR T cells. Uh, I'll briefly go through that. Uh, so the extracellular domain consists of uh, antigen binding uh, single cell variable uh, fragment, 
uh, which provides the epitope affinity. And then we have the hint and transmembrane, um, which provides the structural uh, integrity, but these can also affect. So we are choosing the right uh, um, hinge in the transmembrane provides, uh, it can affect the binding as well as the function. Then comes the intracellular domains, which consist of co-stimulatory molecules and those there are many different kinds of co-stimulatory molecules including CD27, 28, 41BV, ICOR, CD40, etc, etc. And these molecules can affect function, metabolism as well as persistence. Then the, at the end we have this um, CD3 PCR signaling uh, chain which is CD3 zeta which provides the functional trigger as well as the proliferative trigger. Uh, 4.BB, we know that it is meta it provides the metabolic sufficiency and also the persistence of the T cells. So uh, these are some of the landmark uh, clinical trials using the uh, uh, CART9, I mean CD19 CAR T cells. Um, so the main uh, variation in all these uh, different CAR T cells lie in the hinge, transmembrane, and co-stimulatory molecule. And you can see here they have various different kind of uh, hinge, transmembrane, and co-stimulatory co uh, receptors. But regardless of uh, vector utilization or the uh, manufacturing process or the co-stimulatory uh, molecule, they all have shown remarkably high uh, rate of complete response in heme malignancy. And here are the, some of the uh, clinical trials, um, I mean, uh, CAR T cell clinical trials for solid tumors. And you can see there are, uh, they have targeted many different kinds of tumor types. Again, using uh, different vectors, the retro, uh, lentivirus or retrovirus. Um, most of the people have used the uh, ATCs. I mean, there are others with the NK cells or other cell types. Um, the clinical response data is not very exciting. We do have few, very few um, objective responses, PRs and CRs, but most of the time is a disease stabilization. So indicating that we need the design improvement uh, in the CAR T cells to target the solid tumor. And, and this is because of the solid tumor microenvironment is highly immune suppressive, uh, hypoxic, as well as defici deficient in uh, key nutrients. Basically, uh, tumor microenvironment is suboptimal for T cell function. Therefore, strategies have to be devised to reinforce engineered T cells to overcome the uh, tumor microenvironment resistance. The extrinsic, intrinsic factors include the T cell subset selection, effective trafficking, metabolic adaptability, overcoming uh, TME resistance, and delayed exhaustion. And then also the for safety point of view, we have to have the controlled uh, expansion and uh, adding some, uh, it's really um, very hard to find a tumor exclusive antigen, unless the new antigen, uh, but at least if we can have the controlled expansion and adding the safety switch um, to control that expansion uh, would really um, solve, to some, uh, solve the problem to some extent. And here are some of the, um, I mean, this is just the basic structure of the SCFB and the hinge and the transmembrane and all the, the you know, the co-receptors, um, co-stimulatory and CD3 data. Then you can also add some of the gene of your interest, such as the CCR2 or CCR19, uh, which can, uh, um, you know, uh, that can help in the migration and homing of the T cells um, and adding some of the, you know, IL-7 or IL-2 that will provide, IL-7 can provide memory differentiation and proliferation and IL-12 activation and proliferation of T cells as well. 
and then adding some of the like a uh, uh, safety switch uh, one of them is like a, a truncated EGFR so this is fairly simple uh, mechanism if you have the truncated um, uh, EGFR you just have to add the cytoxima and that induces the apoptosis in the cells and cells will not be able to um, survive. I mean, there are other uh, safety switches as the ICAS, ICAS phase 9 or HSV, uh, tyrosine kinases, and all other different kinds of uh, safety switches are there. And here are some of the, uh, the new trials being added. It's uh, around 100 new trials were added, similar to what we have. We have seen it in the biophysics antibody arena. Uh, here also uh, in 2020, 100 new trials, clinical trials were added. Now, uh, coming, uh, moving on to the biospecific antibody on T cells, I'll describe about our platform technology and our clinical data. So. Uh, we use a bi-specific antibody approach to redirect the T cells. Bi-specific antibodies uh, are made by chemical heteroconjugation of two monoclonal antibodies. One antibody is against the CD3 or on the T cells, and the second antibody is against the uh, tumor-associated antigen on the tumor cells. And this can be any uh, anti-HER2, anti-EGFR, anti-GG2, or anti-CD20, whatever um, partner you uh, like to choose. And that's how we make our bi-specific antibodies a fairly uh, simple uh, technology. Um, arming the poly, then we, the T cells are activated by CD3 and IL expanded in IL2. So the activated T cells, arming of the activate, polyclonally activated T cells with bispecific antibody combines the targeting specificity of monoclonal antibody and uh, non-MSC restricted cytotoxicity of T cells. This strategy creates an artificial antibody receptor and converts every T cell into a specific CTL. An engagement of uh, tumors, uh, the T cells with the tumor cells, not only uh, not only lies the tumor cell and release the tumor antigen, but also releases cytokines and chemokines. And this is our, uh, the chemical hydroconjugation process. Um, I'll be referring a lot the HER2 by or EGFR by um, in the next uh, slides. So, anti-CD3, anti-HER2 will be referred as a HER2 by or anti-CD3 and anti-EGFR will be referred as a EGFR by. And here are some of the uh, clinical trials in solid tumor. Um, we, uh, in the uh, metastatic breast cancer, we uh, 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 enrolled 25 patients and we had 23 valuable patients and the survival, overall survival of these patients for 36 months. And if you divide these um, uh, metastatic breast cancer patient uh, into two subgroups, 3 plus and 0 to 2 plus group, and you can see the subgroup which has, which is 3 plus has uh, survival for 57.4 months and zero, um, her to 0 to 2 plus, which is supposed to be negative, where the Herceptin is not given to these patients, their survival is 27.4 months. In uh, adjuvant breast cancer trial, we enrolled nine patients. Five out of nine patients uh, are alive without any disease, and the overall survival is undefined with uh, more than 14 years of follow up. Hormone refractory pro prostate cancer. Uh, again, these are the bisocic antibodies, targeting bisocic antibodies uh, we have used for all these different cancer types. We had uh, seven patients. These are all the phase one clinical trials. Seven pa uh, patients. We had two minor responses and one PR. 
metastatic unresectable pancreatic cancer targeted with the EGF R by seven patients were enrolled in the phase one. We had two CRs, the complete responses, and two SDs, and overall survival was 31 months. Um, we started another phase two trial in metastatic breast cancer uh, using her to buy enrolled 32 patients, and overall survival was 13 months. Neuroblastoma using gd 2 by 17 patients were enrolled, uh, CR in bone marrow for one patient, and this patient was alive for more than uh, four years. We now have another, uh, um, actually, I haven't uh, listed here the metastatic and on the sectoral pan pancreatic cancer trial is ongoing. And um, geoblastoma, pro prostate phase two, and metastatic breast cancer using the PAMBRO is still going on. And uh, we have enrolled some patients and trials are uh, still moving on. So, um, encouraging results with bispecific, uh, with our bispecific antibody on T cell, evidence of some clinical activity and immune responses in solid tumors that are non toxic and can be given in the outpatient clinic in multiple infusions. Working hypothesis is that BATS infusion vaccinates patients against their own tumor. And this is how uh, 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 we, our working hypothesis is that uh, in, in situ uh, immunization after bed treatment is shown up here. So armed uh, T cells will target the tumors, um, lyse tumors, tumor antigens will be released as well as the uh, cytokines, mainly the Th1 cytokines will be released. These Th1 cytokines will inhibit uh, the T the, the tumor suppressive T regulatory cells or myeloid drive suppressor cells. Um, chemokines uh, produced here will be recruiting all the other immune cells in the tumor microenvironment with the eventual um, activation of antigen presenting cells and antigen presentation, uh, antigen presentation to naive T cells and clonal extension and uh, of effector T cells and memory T cell differentiation and uh, diff and development of the long term immunity. So, uh, in best trial, we saw some excellent immune responses, prolonged survival, but not much clinical responses except for uh, in the pancreatic cancer trial. But the numbers were so few to make any uh, meaningful conclu conclusion. So next, we wanted to, to improve the product to withstand the metabolic stress and hypoxic uh, tumor microenvironment in order to improve the clinical responses. And we know that 4-1-BV uh, domain of the car has been shown to have a better metabolic adaptability. So first thing we thought about arming CART-19 uh, with a bispecific antibody to target HER2 positive, EGFR positive, and CD19 negative solid tumors. So we collaborated with Dr. Carl June and he sent us some of the CART-19s and we armed the, uh, the CART-19 and targeted many different types of tumor cells and did many other assays and what we found that CART armed CART, uh, bisphysic antibody armed CART-19 showed enhanced specific cytotoxicity, proliferation, production of uh, Th1 cytokines, chemokines, and, uh, uh, and, and also the better tolerability in the hypoxic environment compared to the bats, suggesting that without SCFD signaling, TCR engagement can co-stimulate the intracellular domain of the car. So uh, that kind of gave us the idea, and that's when um, the headless CAR T cells were born. So I'm going to again uh, discuss multiple formats and preclinical data of uh, headless CAR T cells. So why headless CAR T cells? So the the, the some of the key uh, 
features of this uh, headless car T-cell is that you can just use the single headless car construct um, for any tumor type. So you don't have to make a uh, different construct because the, the in the CAR T-cell right now, they have the SEFB. So SEFB has to be has to be chosen according to the tumor type. So you have to, every time you have to uh, make a new construct. Here you can just use a um, single construct uh, for any tumor type. Arming with biospecific antibody provides a flexibility to target any uh, antigen on different tumor type because these biospecific antibodies are off the shelf antibodies and they have they provide great flexibility. Flexibility to target two antigens simultaneously or sequentially. Um, armed headless car T cells have a cell breaking system. So we don't really need to put any of the um, you know, the suicide gene or uh, safety gene. And here um, is how we made it. This, so we took off the SCFB part of the, so we just have, uh, we right now have a leader hinge transmembrane and then intracellular domain here. So we just ha have uh, no SCFB, but we have like, this PCR. So we use the TCR to, um, to coat our bispecific antibodies. And you can use the two different types of antibodies, uh, like uh, to target two different antigens, and it can be different formats of the antibodies we can use. So it really give, gives you big flexibility. We uh, made uh, many different kinds of constructs, but I have just shown you here some of them. So, uh, first generation and these are some of the uh, second generation constructs and then this is third generation having two co-stimulatory molecules and CD3 zeta. So first thing we did is we uh, we compared the specific uh, cytotoxic activity of various armed or unarmed cart, uh, uh, headless CARTs. Transdued with uh, 41 BBZ ICOS or ICOS 27Z construct. And based on their functional screening, we, uh, for the optimal uh, intracellular domain uh, for the effector function, we chose, I mean, you, you can see like these are the, um, all these three ones showed the like uh, significantly higher cytotoxicity compared to the one which are non-transduced uh, but armed with the her to buy and the bispecific antibody um, T cells um, here shown in the gray and then just the co-activated T cells or bad without arming they are shown up here. They are significantly uh, showed a significantly higher cytotoxic at one to one uh, effective to target ratio. Uh, this is for one cell line, and then we also did it for the, um, uh, these are both breast cancer cell lines, and this is MB231 at 2 to 1 ratio. And again, you can see all the uh, the ones which are uh, being transduced with the 41 BBI cos or ICOS 27 showed uh, significantly higher cytotoxicity compared to uh, other armed uh, control, uh, control um, T cells or co-activated T cells or control CAR T cells. So based on their um, functional screening, we chose um, HCAR 41 BBZ for the next set of experiments. And in the next uh, uh, few next few experiments, I will be referring them as a HCAR because this is only CAR T cells we'll be uh, having the data for. So first thing we just wanted to see the transgene expression. So on day five and day um, day eight, we, we, this is just the coactivated T cells, and then the coactivated T cells transduced with HCAR41 BBZ. Both days, day five and day seven, we have almost 75% uh, cells were transduced. And again, uh, CD4 and CD8 subsets in uh, HCAR41 BB, we uh, we have. Uh, I mean, like, if you can just see on day five and day eight, and across the board, like co co-activated un uh, untransduced cell, or CART19s, or the H-CART, 
they all have pretty much similar 60, uh, 30 to 60 ratio of CD, CD8 is almost 30% and 60% of CD4s. And on similarly on day eight, it is uh, 30, 32 and 63%. And this is across the board, it's pretty much similar. Uh, again, we, we had, we just, uh, uh, after we cultured them for like 10 to 12 days, we uh, thawed them and then we put them in the culture for another 10 to 12 days. And then we wanted to see if what changes we see in the phenotype uh, of these cells. So first thing we did the mammary phenotype. So um, here the T factor mammary, T central mammary, T factor memory re-expressing uh, RA and T naive cells. And this is the CD4 T cells of population. And you can see uh, T factor uh, memory as well as T chimera are uh, significantly higher uh, in the transduce um, CAR T cells, edge uh, cars compared to untransduced cells. Um, not much difference in CD8 uh, T cell population. Um, they're pretty much same or even a little bit higher. T mera is a little higher in the uh, non untransduced T cells. Uh, again, here the co stimulated receptors on CD4. Um, CD4, we can see OX40 and ICOS. Uh, they are significantly higher than the untransduced cells. Again, no, no much difference in the CD8 population. Okay, so next thing what we did, we um, uh, did the, either single arming or uh, sequential arming of uh, not sequential targeting, uh, single targeting or sequential targeting. So I just wanted to explain how we did this experiment. We plated the MCF7 breast cancer cells incubated overnight in 96 well electronic plates uh, for e cell to uh, for the cells to adhere. Next day we added the HER2 by or EGFR by armed H cars at one to one yeah, ET ratio. After 20 24 hours. Uh, wells with the HER2 by were replaced with EGFR by, and the wells with EGFR by were replaced with HER2 by at the same ratio, one to one ratio. And the cytotoxicity was measured uh, for 72 hours by real time cell analysis. And that's where we use the E plates. And you can see uh, the solid lines are shown uh, for the dual targeting, like. Um, HER2 followed by EGFR or EGFR followed by HER2 and these are two different donors, normal donor 1, normal donor 2. Uh, and here the uh, dashed lines are shown for uh, same similarly for single targeting uh, for normal donor 1 and normal donor 2. So you can really see uh, the big difference between the dual targeting versus single targeting here and it's shown um, the difference at the 72 hours is shown up here. And again, um, her to buy, GFR by armed, uh, h cards induced robust levels of interferon gamma, TNF alpha. Um, after our, when they were armed with her to buy or GFR by and uh, again and targeted uh, the MCF7 cell line. And just to let you know, we chose this MCF7 cell line a lot because this has a very low expression of HER2 or EGFR. Even then, these cells are able to target and completely kill 100%, 90 to 100%. Within, uh, if you put them in a higher ratio, uh, ET ratio, uh, 90 to 100% within 24 hours. We choose to uh, keep the ratios like 1 to 1 or 1 to uh, 2 to 1. And as well as the, um, the chemokines, uh, Mibon Beta, IP10, and Rentis. So here are the, uh, we show the hypox, uh, hypoxia differentially affects, uh, affected the survival depending on the co stimulatory and the domain. So under normoxia, this, under normoxia, we see in the 28, uh, um, the cells transduce with the CD328 uh, uh, zeta 
showed 5% um, apoptosis. Cells transduced with uh, BBZ Zeta showed uh, the one which is our H card showed 8% uh, the apoptosis. Under hypoxia, 0.5% oxygen, we see 61% apoptosis in CD28Z card. And uh, here we only see 13% and 72, 72% in first generation card. So, I mean, so h card 41 bbz show metabolically enhanced activity and are able to withstand hypoxic TNA. And then we have shown by multiple experiments, it's um, definitely uh, significantly different. So, okay, so they can survive. What about if they can function? So next thing we wanted to see is whether uh, they can also, they can be cytotoxic to the tumor cells under hypoxia. So in this, uh, here what we have done is uh, we have used the 100 micromolar cobalt chloride. So it's a chemically induced hypoxia. Um, and we left the, uh, uh, these uh, cells for 120 hours to see the, the effect of CAR T cells um, or the non-transduced T cells for, uh, in hypoxia, normoxia as well as in the hypoxia. So what we have shown, basically in the, in, um, the solid lines are actually the one which is a normoxia. It's in the red one is a, the CAR T, not unarmed CAR T cells. And the uh, one which in the green is a uh, hard to buy arm cardi cell. And so the solid line is a normoxia and the dashed line is a uh, hypoxic one. Then you can see there's no significant difference in the killing. Uh, even like, you know, you can start very early. I mean, the, the difference goes a little bit up here, but then they really match up right up here. Uh, again, like here, when you see the um, HER2 uh, armed co-activated T cells, Big difference between normoxia and hypoxia. Uh, I mean, of course, the unarmed T cells definitely, um, they're much, uh, they're unable to really kill well at all. So, um, HER2, uh, HER2 card, um, I mean, this is just the one by specific antibody we have uh, used, but if in any antibody in any cell line we can use, we know that 4 uh, one bbz can withstand the uh, survive. They can they can survive in the hypoxia, and they can also be highly efficient uh, um, in killing in hypoxic environment. So, in summary, biosensitive antibody armed headless CAR T cells can proliferate and effectively kill multiple tumor targets in serial and sequential killing fashion. Biosensitive antibody armed headless CAR T cells exhibit superior survival in hypoxic condition. Biosensitive antibodies armed uh, headless CAR T cells release immune modulating and tumor killing cytokines and chemokines. And the future direction for us to submit the IMD and start the phase one trial with this study. And thanks to those, uh, those who made it happen. And I would like to uh, thank our collaborator, uh, Dr. Carl June and Dr. John Schaller, and also um, the funding coming from all these social, um, RO1 grants and also startup, UVA startup funds. Thank you all for your attention. That's a very informative presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Takakur. Um, and again, to our audience, um, so we uh, will hold all the questions until the QA session, the end of the webinar. Um, so, but you can uh, feel free to tap the questions in the QA panel. Okay, so next let's welcome Dr. Luca Varani to present his work. Dr. Varani, please feel free to begin when you're ready. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Good afternoon or morning, I guess, depending on what you are. Sharing my screen in a second. Can you please let me know if it's okay? 
Yes, it's okay. Okay, great. So um, we had this uh, very nice talk and overview of bispecific antibodies in cancer, and that's a acknowledged role of bispecifics. Uh, I'm talking about infectious diseases instead, and uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID in particular. I hope by the end of the talk, you will agree with me that there is a role for bispecifics uh, in uh, infectious diseases as well. So in this first slide, uh, I assume that there is no need to introduce uh, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-2, I will call it for the rest of the talk. Uh, everybody knows it. Maybe we need to say a little bit about antibodies against uh, SARS-2. Well, they do work. They have proven to be very effective in treating humans and preventing serious consequences from the disease. Uh, they work. They, many people ask me, there is a vaccine, why do you need antibodies? Antibodies are much more expensive than vaccines to produce and uh, administer. Well, uh, not everybody can be vaccinated. There are people that are allergic or perhaps don't want to be vaccinated. There are people that get vaccinated but do not produce antibodies, so immunosuppressed patients or cancer patients and the likes. Uh, finally, there are people that even if are not ill, do not respond well to a vaccine, or for instance, we know that vaccine pro protection wanes over time. So after a few uh, months or several months, uh, the vaccine is not as protective as we would like. So all these people are at risk of uh, serious consequences uh, of uh, COVID-19. And we know that unfortunately there are people that end up in intensive care even if they are uh, uh, fully vaccinated and everything. So that's one use of uh, antibodies to treat these kind of people. Uh, the other setting or the other, uh, yeah, let's call it setting, is uh, a local outbreak. So imagine an outbreak in a hospital or maybe a uh, elderly, uh, a place of elderly, I'm missing the English word for it, sorry, a retirement house or whatever. Uh, if you give a vaccine, uh, this takes about, uh, well, several weeks, four, six weeks uh, to give you protection. Uh, it's the time the immune system requires to mount a proper response. Instead, an antibody is active and protective immediately upon administration. So if there is a local outbreak in a hospital, for instance, you go in, you treat people with antibody, and they are immediately protected. And in this case, protection can be prophylactic. So you give antibody before the, uh, to protect from infection, before the infection, or you can give it therapeutically. People get infected, you treat them with antibody. And in the second case, Efficacy of antibodies currently on the market available to humans is very, very high, above 80%. But the caveat is that you need to administer the antibodies very early during the infection, uh, ideally in the first three days of infection. And uh, without getting into the details, maybe if you're curious, we can discuss it in the Q&A session. But the idea in COVID is that uh, the first week, typically, so initially you have a viral disease, the virus is in your body and reproduces. Uh, this is not uh, nice by any means, but usually it's not deadly. And however, in the second week, you start having an inflammatory response, which is really bad. And in most cases, that is what kills the patient. And uh, antibodies that uh, neutralize, that kill the virus, will not do anything against the inflammatory uh, phase. So that's... Uh, Basically, that's the idea of antibodies. They work. There are a number of antibodies already in the market or in the clinic, and uh, they all follow the same strategy. That is uh, getting antibodies against something called the RBD, the receptor binding domain. It's a region of the spike virus, of the spike protein of the virus, which is, uh, it is the region that the virus uses to interact with its cellular receptor, it's called ACE2. It's the protein that the virus uses to uh, bind initially and then enter the human cells. And they work, and don't get me wrong, they worked very efficiently and uh, they were produced very rapidly. So that was clearly the right way to go to treat or to find a treatment for this uh, pandemic. But again, they are all the same. Uh, we, our research group, uh, we are not a pharmaceutical company. We are basic scientists. We can 
I thought, we thought that we could try to do something a bit different, uh, in this case, by specific antibodies. Uh, the idea is uh, that even if we get something maybe a little more sophisticated, perhaps a little more complicated, but it has advantages, if not immediately, at least uh, for, the, uh, for the future or for the, let's say, for the next few months. And so we concentrated, as I was saying, on bispecific antibodies. So the idea, if you want a new, well, I believe that if there is a new antibody, a new uh, treatment that needs to come in line for COVID-19 now, uh, you have to make sure of at least two things. So first of all, it needs to work against uh, existing variants and hopefully future variants. And it, does, it must not stimulate the generation of new variants uh, by itself. So we know that SARS-2 uh, is very, very happy to mutate, either by natural evolution, the variants of concern that are everywhere around the world, or in response to treatment. So this happens both in vitro and in vivo. You treat uh, well, animals, for instance, with an antibody, they very rapidly generate escape mutants. That is, uh, the virus mutates so that the treatment, the antibody in this case, is not uh, effective anymore. Uh, what can we do about it? Well, one strategy is to use a combination of antibodies, two or more antibodies that target individual regions on the virus. And the idea is that to escape these antibodies, the virus will need to mutate simultaneously in two places. If one place changes, there is still the second arm of the bispecific or, or the cocktail that works. And the same is true for uh, natural uh, variants. Uh, if uh, something changes, and there are, well, if something changes, there is still the second antibody in the cocktail or in the specific that works. This is not a, a theoretical scenario. There was, for instance, the Eli Lilly antibody that seemed to be very nice, and less than a week after it was on the market, the new variant came out and the antibody failed almost completely. This was a monoclonal antibody. So why, so this cocktails or by specific, why by specific? Well, one advantage is that uh, in a bispecific, you need to, well, you can, uh, uh, you have the advantages of a cocktail in a single molecule. So the production line, for instance, and the development time is uh, halved. You do not have to produce uh, two molecules, two cell lines, two production lines, uh, uh, bioreactors and whatnot. There is currently a shortage of bioreactors and uh, materials of production of biologics in the world. This is uh, particularly relevant for poor countries. Well, in these scenarios, having to produce one molecule instead of two is certainly advantageous. And if you think about uh, mRNA delivery strategies of antibodies, not a vaccine, uh, well, delivery cocktail is really not evident, both under practical molecular considerations and under uh, regulatory. Uh, requirements. So we thought there is a, uh, a place for bispecific. How do we do it? Well, we do something we like to call structure-based antibody engineering. And that is, uh, we use uh, every information that we have, the structure, if you have it, the binding site, the neutralization properties, uh, whatever information, you name it, we use it. And we use this information to modify, to alter, to engineer, to construct in some case, either monoclonal antibodies, we want to change them, or in this case, multi-specific, bispecific and tri-specific construct. Then we design them. And uh, now after a design, we basically have two options. We can uh, produce uh, several of them, maybe even hundreds, and test all of them randomly, hoping that something works. Uh, frankly, we do not have the resources to do so. And uh, personally, I enjoy thinking about this uh, sort of things a little more. I think I find it more enjoyable, as I was saying. So what we do is a little different. We use computational simulations to try to find out, and structural considerations in general, to try to find out what is a stable, a good construct. Uh, in this case, I'll come back to the computational simulation in a moment, but in this case for SARS-2, what we wanted to produce was a bispecific antibody here in the left, that on the left, that was as close as possible to a natural full IgG antibody. Uh, so 
There are a few other groups that have produced bispecific from nanobodies, from camelid antibodies, these sort of things. Uh, in my mind, they are, they are nice, but they are not uh, ideal. Half-life in vivo can be problematic or immune reaction if it's uh, non-human uh, molecules, etc. So what we wanted to do instead, it's a full IgG by specific, uh, by specific here on the left. And we chose what's called the CrossMab format, it's something that was mentioned in the previous talk as well. Uh, the idea is, uh, well, first of all, uh, to have a bispecific, it's in green and blue here in this uh, drawing. But if you simply mix the four chains that are required to produce a bispecifics, uh, heavy and light chain of the two antibodies, then you end up with shuffling and undesirable pairing of the chains. For instance, you have a mixture of green and blue that actually is not functional. This is problematic for production, especially for uh, scaling up and developability. Uh, one of the ways to solve the problem was uh, invented some 10 years ago by Christian Klein and co-workers at uh, Roche, 2011, this was a publication. And the idea is to engineer the FC region with something called knob in the all. So it's a modification, complementary modifications in the two chains of the two monoclonals, of the two parental monoclonals is what is called. Uh, so that only the right pairing, well, to ensure, to try to ensure formation only of the right pairing. And this knob in the all technology was known before the CrossMap. And then, the CrossMap idea is actually very, very elegant, and it is a swap of the CL and CH1 region here of one of the antibodies. Uh, for details that I'm not going into now for brevity, this ensures that only the right by specific pain of, uh, pair is formed, sorry. So this is what we chose in our project. Uh, we wanted uh, the antibody to be human, and so we chose these two antibodies are called C121 and C135. They are monoclonals, parental monoclonals, uh, developed, discovered by Rockefeller University, Michel nonsens group. Uh, we just code them and uh, uh, fuse them together in a molecule. And I will talk about these later on. On the right, instead, the strategies we did. So we tried the cross map a little bit at the bottom with uh, two different pairs of antibodies, the green and the orange one. And uh, as a safety net, we also tried uh, single chain by specific antibodies at the top. So this would not have AFC, although you would uh, be able to fuse it at one end uh, later if needed. But this is something simpler that worked in the past in our end, and so we just produced them. And all these four molecules actually neutralize the virus SARS-CoV-2. This is here at the bottom. Uh, very, very potently. So IC50 is a picomolar, is subnanomolar, which is really, really good. And this was a pseudovirus experiment. How we design antibodies? So I was mentioning the uh, computational simulations. So the problem is that you cannot take any two antibodies and make a bispecific out of them. They need to be in the proper conformation. They need to be on the proper side of the structure, especially if you want to build something like an IgG, CrossMap in this case, uh, which has uh, structural constraints of its own. You cannot just bind anything with an IgG. If you're doing single chain by specifics, you have a little more flexibility because you can use uh, linkers that can be uh, changed. But again, as I say, so this is the uh, idea, not every pair of antibody can be used. And then we generate these structures here on the left, and we run uh, molecular dynamic simulations on the computer, on the supercomputers. So if you know what they are, fine. If not, we basically ask the computer, is this structure, is this antibody stable in this conformation? And in the case of the spike of SARS-2, uh, the spike has several different conformations. Again, if you know the details, great. If not, it doesn't matter. But the message is, for instance, that the RBD uh, can be in the so-called up and down configurations, and uh, there are several different conformers. So we made sure with computers that our molecule would block, would bind to all these conformers, every possible conformation, and block it. And we would hope achieve viral neutralization. So this is the 
design. And uh, designing is not enough. Of course, we need to produce production. Yeah, that's good, but you also need to characterize it. So the quality of what you produce is really, really important. And here, to give you an idea of the problems, if you start on the left, uh, this is a, a chromatogram. Basically, what you have is the monomer is the bispecific that we want, but we also have a lot, or we had a lot of side products that are really not good. I mean, yes, you could probably put this into cells and get neutralization, but that's not a nice molecule to work with and to characterize. Uh, we are a structural biology group. We are used to see perhaps more uh, problems and defects in the molecules that we would actually like to know. So in this case, we started with something problematic, but we very rapidly moved to a conformation like the one on the right, monomer and dimer, and it is not shown that we actually now have only a monomer. And we did a biophysical characterization to make sure that uh, it's a single uh, species, it's stable over time, it's well characterized, uh, it binds. So basically, it, it, good. it is what we wanted. So this is production, quality control, if you want. The next question that we have to answer is, uh, are both arms of the bispecific functional? Do they bind their target? And to answer this question, we, in this case, we employ the SPR, surface plasmos resonance based competitive assay. Basically, again, details are really not important, but I will be happy to answer questions later if you're curious. But briefly, the idea is that here in the top left, for instance, we get the antigen, we saturate the binding site, one of the binding site with one of the parental monoclonal, and then we get in with a bispecific, we have a bind, we detect a binding event, it means that the second arm of the bispecific different from the saturated monoclonal works. We repeat it with our, uh, uh, with our parental monoclonal, so we know both arms work, and at the bottom it's the opposite. First, we put the bispecifics in, uh, we saturate the binding site, then we go in, go in with a monoclonal and there is no binding because both arms of the bispecific engage their target. So this is good, but it's still not a bispecific. So this only tells us that both arms can bind, but to be a bispecific, they need to bind at the same time, simultaneously. And to demonstrate this, we use the NAVAR SPR-based assay, in this case, an ability assay. Uh, it's a little bit complicated. Again, something we can answer later if you're curious. But the summary of this slide is that we showed that our bispecific, it's called COVEX-2, by the way, um, can bind simultaneously with both arms to the same antigen, to the RBD, uh, which is this region of the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So that's great. The antibody does what uh, it is uh, supposed to do. Uh, these are binding. These are not functional assays. So does it also work? Well, to answer this question, we started with the ACE2 inhibition assay. Uh, I was mentioning earlier, the virus binds, the spike protein of the virus binds to ACE2 on the human cells. And inhibition of ACE2 binding is what all the first uh, uh, generation of antibodies do. So they were fished out, they were selected to prevent uh, binding of uh, ACE2 of the virus to ACE2. And we knew this was a good strategy because uh, antibodies against MERS, against SARS-1, the virus from 2003, uh, did the same thing. The best neutralizing antibodies were inhibiting ACE2 binding. So this is the theory. In practice, uh, we run this assay. This is ELISA-based on the right. So if, if you start with gray, this is an isotype control. It's an antibody not related to SARS-2. We put it in, so we have the spike, we add the antibody, and then we add ACE2, and the signal, if you can see it, remains high. So this means that there is no inhibition. Okay, good. Then we look at the blue one. This is one of the parentals monoclonal. It's called, it's called the C135. Uh, this we know that, is not, that this is not supposed to inhibit ACE2. We know that C135 binds to another region of the spike protein, so that's fine. It doesn't inhibit. Great. That's exactly as we were expecting. And then we go with a green parental monoclonal, and we were a little bit surprised because uh, 
Yes, the signal goes down, which means that there is inhibition. ACE2 does not bind if the antibody is present on the spike, but it does so only partially. And it's not complete. It doesn't go down at the bottom. And frankly, I cannot quite explain to you why this happened. We have some uh, ideas, but we did not demonstrate it uh, unequivocally. If you put the bispecific instead in purple, you have 100% inhibition. You have full inhibition of ACE2 binding. So clearly, it's a cooperative effect of the two moieties of the bispecific. So, or in other words, you can say that the bispecific, it's a different molecules, it has its own properties. It's not just like its parental monoclonals. It does something more. It does something more. That's good. So this is a functional assay, but it is a, a biochemical assay. Well, the next question is, uh, does the antibody uh, neutralize or prevent viral infection? And we did so, we proved this. So here at the top, these are uh, uh, in vitro pseudovirus neutralization assays. They were run by Frauke Musche. I apologize for the pronunciation. I never get the surname right. Sorry for that. Uh, but she did a wonderful job at uh, Rockefeller University. And uh, she showed that uh, our bispecific neutralizes the virus. Again, very, very potently. This is a subnanomolar binding. And it also neutralizes all the escape mutants generated by the individual, uh, individual parental monoclonals, as it was supposed to do. Uh, it's the idea I was telling you at the beginning. If one, uh, if a virus mutates and one antibody or one site, one alpha of a bispecific fails, while well, there is still the other alpha that uh, kicks up. So this at the top was pseudovirus. At the bottom, instead, these were experiments done on live infectious virus isolated from human patients by our, our other collaborators at the Pavia Hospital, Pavia University Hospital uh, in Italy, Irene Cassaniti. She did the work. This is a BSL3 work. It's really uh, impressive that she could do all of this. And uh, we could show that our bispecific antibody neutralizes its discharge here the virus from all the variants of concern that are circulating. And the values, while well, they are in vitro, of course, uh, they are not in humans, but the values are very good. So these numbers are equal or better than anything else that is uh, on the market uh, out there. So we were happy. The molecule seems to work uh, in the lab, in vitro. Uh, what about in vivo? And to test it, we went to Daniel Ruzek and Radislav Sedlacek, our collaborators at the Czech Republic, uh, Czech Academy of Science. Uh, they generated a very nice uh, mice animal model of uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, they are basically uh, animals with humanized ACE2 lungs. And uh, the model is very sensitive to viral infection. You have very evident loss of weight and the pathological signs. Uh, they actually reproduce the COVID-19 disease in humans very well. You also have the inflammatory sta uh, stages and the macrophage infiltration and, and such. And uh, what we did uh, at the, in the middle was to compare neutralization or protection from the virus with a bispecific in purple of the parental monoclonal, green and blue. And I don't know if you can see it, a little, it's a little small, but here at two days, uh, there is uh, this chart shows the amount of virus in the lungs of the animals. And with a bispecific, after two days, there is no viral, whereas the monoclonal still at the sun, day five, everything works. But this is also encouraging. It shows that the bispecific, it's really effective. It's better than the monoclonal. And this was a, a prophylactic settings. So first we gave the monoclonal and then the virus. Or at the bottom, we did the same experiment, but in therapeutic settings, first the virus and then the antibody with the same result. So the bispecific works in animal as well. But to finish off, I just wanted to show you a, a bit of a curiosity. So here at the top left, you have a plot of the weight of the animals over time. Uh, gray, again, is an isotype control. It's an antibody that has nothing to do with COVID, with SARS-2. And the animals become sick, they lose weight, and unfortunately, they, uh, well, they reach uh, termination. So this is fine. This is expected because it's an unrelated antibody. 
If we treat the animals with a green monoclonal C121, we have the same result, basically. And this was a bit surprising because C121, it's a very, very potent monoclonal. Yet, it doesn't work in animals, whereas the bispecific in purple remain very, very effective. The animals are really healthy all the time. What happens? So we sequenced the virus from the, uh, from the animals treated with the two antibodies, and we noticed that in all the C121 treated animals, in all the parental monoclonal, uh, animals treated with a parental monoclonal, the virus had mutated. So instead of having E484, which was a wild type virus, all the animals show the E484D mutation. A couple of considerations. So first of all, the fact that the same mutation showed up in every animal suggests that probably the mutation was there to start with. So there was a small percentage of the virus that uh, was already mutated. And this of course was done with uh, infectious virus, again, isolated from uh, human patients. Um, second consideration, it's a small mutation, E2D is really not a huge difference, and yet it is enough to make the treatment fail, the antibody fail. And finally, E484 is a place, it's a position that gets mutated over and over, both uh, in vitro, in scientific experiments, and in real life. So the Brazilian variant, the uh, South African variant, beta, some of the Indian ones, they all have this E484 mutation. So what happened is that you have an antibody, the virus cannot kill it when you treat it with a monoclonal, and so this escape mutant, this mutant of the, of the virus, takes, uh, uh, becomes dominant. It expands, and eventually the animals succumb to it. The bispecific, instead, doesn't do it specifically because it is designed not to do it. Even if one half of a bispecific, let's say the green part of a bispecific fails, there is still the other half that works, neutralizes the virus, prevents the escape mutant from uh, taking place and becoming dominant. So that's it, basically. I apologize, I spoke a little faster. I wanted to be uh, short. Uh, I hope you are convinced that yes, by specific antibodies have a role in infectious diseases. I'm not saying that they, are, they should be the only weapon against COVID-19 or infectious diseases in general, but again, it would be wrong in my mind to disregard them completely. Uh, they are, there are advantages. They can do things that monoclonal do not do. Uh, a single by specific can be more than the sum of the two parental monoclonal they have development and production advantages. Uh, yes, under GMP production, by specifics are a little more complicated to develop, but with modern technology, you can get uh, in excess of, of, of five grams per liter of by specific, which is a very reasonable yield and can be used in real life application. So finally, just acknowledgements, uh, the work was done, uh, was funded by the ATAC consortium is called, is a European Union Horizon 2020 consortium. Uh, they gave us the money to develop the molecule. They have now given us money to start the GMP production and the phase one clinical trial, which uh, we all hope are going to go well. And uh, uh, I need to thank in particular the people highlighted in yellow. These are the uh, postdocs and students that did the work. In my group at the IRB, uh, Raul De Gaspero, Mattia Pedotti, Luca Simonelli, and Federica Mazzola, they worked really hard uh, last year on this project and in general. And so I'm very, very happy for them that we could get a nice nature publication out of it. Uh, Davide Robbiani, he was uh, first in New York and then he moved to the IRB in Bellinzona in Switzerland. Uh, quite frankly, the project would not have happened uh, without him. The original monoclonals come from New York. So, of course, very, very grateful to him. Uh, in New York, that's uh, Rockefeller University. That's where the parental monoclonal come from. Luigi Calzolai, in particular, from the European Union Joint Research Center. They helped with some of the physical characterization. Uh, Daniel Ruzek and uh, all the people at the Czech Academy of Science, uh, the animal model was instrumental to this work. It really would have had no impact without it. And let me spend some words on Fausto Baldanti, Antonio Piralla, and Elena Percivalle. The people at the uh, San Mateo Hospital in Pavia, 
They were the first to brace the full impact of COVID-19 outside China. So they were in the region of Italy that was hit in very hard in February 2020. Uh, they worked uh, like crazy with real life people, not doing only science. They deserve a lot of credit. And of course, thank you, thanks a lot to Creative Biolabs for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our work. And thank you very much. Really, thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Dr. Rani. Great presentation. And I hope our audience enjoyed both presentations as much as they did. Um, okay, so without further delay, let's go to the QA session. All right. Um, so we have the first question for uh, Dr. Takbur. Um, so is it uh, possible to confirm that effect is from the um, BAT and not from the bispecific antibody, which has dissociated from the cell? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, is it? Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to confirm that effect is uh, from the uh, bispecific antibody armed activated T cells and not from the bispecific antibody, which has dissociated from the cell? Yeah, so we know it, dis it doesn't <coughs> get dissociated. It always sticks there, and we have checked that it only gets diluted as the uh, number of division goes on. So, like, if you if you have we have usually we are um, the arming dose is fifty nanograms per million um, CAR T cells or per million T cells. So, as the uh, the cells divide, the number of bispecific antibody on each cells becomes half and half, and that's how it's a self breaking system. But yes, it's a fact of yeah we have done unarmed versus armed T-cells, and we know it's the effect is because of the bispecific antibodies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the second question is about uh, BAT again. Uh, so is the product manufactured a cell therapy, uh, which is cells pre-bound with bispecific, or is the bispecific antibody administered directly? No. Yes, we, uh, we do it like we... Um, make the uh, activate their cells first and uh, active uh, expand them to the numbers uh, for whatever the dose is required for the particular protocol and then after harvesting those cells we arm them with the bispecific antibody and put them into the bags uh, number of bags usually our infusions uh, are four to eight infusion depending on what uh, type of tumor we are targeting and we we have this product which is antibody armed product so we don't infuse uh, the t cell separately and then administer the antibody separately now it's together they are armed and then whatever the unbound antibodies are we wash it off so there's only uh, cells which has the antibody uh, bound to them okay thank you and the third question is about the headless CAR T. Mm -hmm. So, could there be any potential clinical safety risk if other cells also pre present in low quantities in the cell starting material, such as CD34 positive or CD19 positive cells, were transduced? The, um, the cells were transduced to express the bispecific antibody. Yeah, so when we the our uh, T cell activation and expansion strategy, it's ninety five percent cells are T cells in the CAR T cell um, uh, in the CAR T cells or bionic T cells or just the activated T cell. Five percent uh, cells could be NK cells, some of the um, monocytes, and a little bit of the, um, the um, B cells as well. I mean, we have treated 185 patients so far, but we really haven't uh, come across any problem with these 5% or 7% contamination, contaminating cells. Thank you. And uh, our last question for you is, uh, how do you assess the developability of um, bispecific antibody armed CAR-T before potential subjected to uh, GMP manufacture? 
Um, so when our vice president antibody um, technology is fairly simple, is the uh, chemical hydroconjugation based technology. So I mean, of course, the the big issue with this technology that we have the multimers, dimers, and the monomers. But the the the, um, the the neat part is that uh, when we arm the uh, T cells with these spike specific antibodies, all the um, monomers, uh, which is against the um, tumor uh, antigen, is completely washed off because we wash them three times to remove all the unbound antibody. It's only CD3 part, CD3 and uh, uh, anti TA, tumor associated antigen antibody, um, by specific antibody is attached. The monomers, which is anti-TEA or anti-CD3, is removed. So, um, it, it's it's uh, um, manufacturing-wise, it's a lot of, like, we only get, the dimer uh, is only 20 to 25 percent most of the time. It's 70 to 75 percent. Uh, is the mono monomers and uh, multimers. Multimers also bound, but uh, monomers are the highest quantity, like 60%. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Takur, for answering these questions. So um, next is for questions uh, for Dr. Warani. Um, our first question is, how does the mixture of the two separate potential antibodies compare with the single by specific? Uh, yes, so that's a very fair, very important question. So one of the problems is that when you test them in vitro, these uh, antibodies are so potent, even the parental monoclonal, the isolated monoclonal, that uh, uh, it's very difficult to appreciate the differences, the statistical differences in uh, in vitro experiments. Nonetheless, we have experiments where the bispecific seems to be a little better, not by much, but three or two or three times better than uh, the mixture of the monoclonals. However, where there is a clear advantage is when you start uh, testing uh, mutants, escape mutants of the parental antibodies or variants, and then uh, the bispecific uh, works better than uh, the single mixture of the two monoclonals. So that's... Uh, in animals, actually, our colleague in the Czech Republic may think that uh, in animals that would be a stronger, a more significant advantage, something similar, something that would be seen more easily. Um, we have not done the experiments because it's not uh, easy to justify ethically to uh, sacrifice animals just for this purpose. Thank you. And our question for you is, have you completed the GLP preclinical safety studies for the molecule? I'm not sure what uh, they mean by this answer, so by this question. If they mean uh, toxicology, formal toxicology, we have not yet done it with a bispecific. Uh, we, are under, we are doing GMP production now, so we've, uh, I think I can say that with transient uh, expression, uh, transient transfection cells, the, prod the molecule is produced very well. Um, we are not particularly worried about toxicology because uh, the parental monoclonals are humans. Uh, the format, the cross map was chosen specifically because it is in the clinic with uh, several uh, different products, I believe 10 of them, uh, but anyway, it is safe. Uh, the parental monoclonals have been tested for toxicology and they are safe in humans. So we think and we certainly hope that the bike specific will have no problems as well. Thank you. And we have another question for you is, can one type by specific antibody fight different variants of yes. the SARS-CoV-2? Yeah. Yes, that's the idea of the by specific so that uh, the virus needs to change a lot to kill uh, both arms of the by specific. And uh, in this case, we tested it with uh, all the variants of concern from the original one virus, the D614G, the Italian variant that showed up already in March 2020, uh, the alpha, beta, gamma, delta variants, we covered all of them. Uh, this was for neutralization with live infectious virus. And then we tested binding with uh, probably 20, 25 uh, RVD mutants, so viral mutants, and the antibody still works. So yes, the idea behind by specific is that you have a, a more breadth of action, let's say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have last question for you. So 
would you think it's a good idea if the FC immediate functions such as ADCC uh, are altered in the development of anti uh, bispecific antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2? So this is a very, very interesting question. Um, I actually take a small detour about it. So one of the theoretical risks with uh, SARS-CoV-2 is antibody-dependent enhancement. Uh, this is something that we know very well from, from, from uh, flaviviruses. Uh, basically, antibodies, uh, instead of protecting you from the virus, make it worse, uh, activate cytokine storm, inflammatory responses, and eventually kill the patient. And uh, we know that this happens in, in humans in flaviviruses or RSV. Uh, there, are, uh, there is evidence in uh, laboratory animals and cells but this can also happen with SARS-1, SARS, uh, MERS, and SARS-2. Now, of course, these are experiments designed to provoke enhancements. So in humans, we probably have not seen it. There are no reports on it. Um, it would happen when the virus starts to mutate significantly to become significantly different from what we have now. No reason to get into the details. But uh, what you can... The, one of the causes of enhancement is uh, interaction between uh, the virus and the FC receptor portion of antibodies. And again, I'm skipping the details. So we know that if we mutate the FC region, LALA mutants or LALA PG mutants or GRLR, then we abolish interaction with complement and with FC receptor and we remove uh, enhancement. So, we did this with our molecule. Uh, we tested our bispecific with this uh, mutated FC, and it still works. It's still fine. Now, this is not what was asked. So this is not ADCC or the likes. Um, there is uh, another antibody, the one from uh, VIRGSK, that is uh, suppose, supposedly works better in humans because of uh, ADCC. So. It's a complicated issue. Uh, I would think that yes, it is worth uh, uh, engaging or uh, engineering the FC for interaction with other systems, let's say with complement. Uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, there might be the risk of uh, enhancement. Uh, this is something that the regulatory bodies, EMA and FDA also have acknowledged. It's out there. Uh, we, we don't have it in humans, so good enough, but so far we don't have it, but it is out there. and. Uh, uh, FC, FC engineering of antibodies would provide an answer to it. It does work in uh, flaviviruses, FC engineering. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rani, for answering all the questions. And due to time constraints, we have to wrap it up for today. I want to thank uh, very much again our speakers, Dr. Taku and Dr. Varani, for joining us today. And um, so you will receive a follow-up email from Critio Labs with access to the uh, recording of this uh, webinar. And we will also follow up with our uh, audience if you have any further questions. And please um, direct the questions to our email address uh, that is up on your screen. Um, Creative Bell Labs, we will continue to host more webinars with different topics in the areas of life sciences and uh, technology. A survey window will pop up on your screen as you exit and your participation will be appreciated as we hope to improve our webinars. I encourage everyone to visit our website often and stay tuned for our next webinar series. So last, we hope that you will find our webinar informative and you all will have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Thank Brandy. you again, goodbye, have a great day. Uh, Dr. Virani, that was an excellent uh, presentation um, and congratulations for this amazing biosensing antibody. And thank you, Creative BioLabs and Ping, for uh, hosting this webinar. Thank you. Sure. All. Thank all right. you so much for joining us.